I'm Dave Aronchek. Um, I lead Compute Over Data at Protocol Labs. Um, that does both um, our Web 2 and Web 3 projects, as well as the Baka Yao project, which you may have uh, heard about. It's the overall uh, infrastructure we use to enable truly decentralized compute. And what I'm here to talk to you about today is what the vision and the reason we're investing all this in Filecoin, in IPFS, in Protocol Labs, in decentralized compute, and what I really think it unlocks about the future of um, infrastructure as a, as a whole. Um, the first is to think about why compute over data actually matters. And, and it's the numbers that you see up here that make all the difference in the world. Uh, by 2025, you're going to have over 175 zettabytes of data stored in the world. I mean, numbers that are so big that are difficult to, to really imagine. Um, and it's growing incredibly rapidly. 42% uh, year-over-year enterprise growth, 60% of companies already have more than a petabyte. And when you start talking about numbers that big, you're, you now start to really run into networking issues. And moving that data is slow and expensive. Data growth is, being out, or is outpacing network growth by 45% every year. And even if it wasn't, you would still be concerned about things like governance and requirements, hardware that you're going to need to run on, so on and so forth. Being able to position the compute next to where the data is in the scenario that you particularly have is incredibly important. And so if it's this bad, what are people doing today? And I think it's really important to take a step and say, like, where are the problems that people are having so that we can lean into the future where you start to get to be, uh, like, unlocking people doing decentralized things. What they're doing today is one of three things. They're using centralized systems. They're building it themselves to solve this decentralized problem. Or they're just doing nothing. And I'll touch on each one of these. The first is they're using centralized systems. Um, you might see logos like you see right up here on the slide for ways that people handle distributed compute. Because these numbers, petabytes of data, are so much larger than any single deployment, any single machine is going to be able to handle. You have to use uh, uh, clustered systems like this. Which is okay, but it ultimately resolves in you having a central API server. The problem with a central API server is you attach all these machines, you attach all this data to it. Your data scientist comes along, she says, well, look, I'd like to run some data analysis on a particular workload. She does so, and she's great. It, it ran fine. Except that she has more requirements. Maybe she wants to run on multiple clouds. Maybe she wants to run on ships. Maybe she wants to run on-prem. Maybe she wants to run in particular regions that have different legal requirements. Uh, and, and all that sums up to running outside of your core data center. The problem is those centralized systems really don't adapt to, to those kind of problems. They don't know how to move things and handle the irregular, unreliable network, regulatory concerns that are involved in running across all of these various locations. So then we say, okay, fine, your, data, or your developer comes along and she says, well, I'm going to build it ourselves. We're going to build it for our own enterprise. How hard could this be? She builds it, she builds a custom orchestration system that does have more awareness. And our data scientist says, okay, now it's time to run, and she can now run in all these places that she detailed to the developer up front after many, many months uh, uh, you know, and years, potentially, of building out that orchestration system. So, so far, so good. Except now she would like to add some additional requirements. Maybe she'd like to schedule against data locality, run against particular geos, maybe regulations change, partners change, all those kind of things. Um, and our developer, who was you know, on the team actually managing this thing, now she wants to go on vacation, as she has a right to do, and our data scientist is out of luck. She can no longer do the things that she wants to do because it was just them running and maintaining that custom orchestration system. So more often than not, what you see is people actually just doing nothing. Uh, and you're like, well, what does that actually mean? Well, um, you take something like a city that might have an entire CCTV system. And their job is to collect all this data, all these videos to actually process it. Today, you might think, well, what I should do is I should move this all into a central data center so I can process all this va very valuable data, get faster response, inform my emergency teams, whatever it might be. Unfortunately, this is, and this is a very real scenario, that would be 4.4 petabits a day of inbound traffic. Even if your systems could handle it, you would be talking about enormous millions of dollars just to support that kind of in ingress. 
So instead, what you say is you do nothing. You have your police officer, your doctor, your uh, administrator, uh, your fire person um, go and, and simply watch them on local machines and then toss those videos into the trash. And by that, I mean what the data is goes back to that original stat that I was talking about earlier where 68% of data is simply unused. Someone may look at it, but it's not stored, it's not archived, no one's really doing anything with it. So solution number one is, hey, let's build on top of open source compute over data platforms. In this case, instead of using a custom orchestration system, they use one that is open source and built for a truly decentralized world. Now, this is open source and extensible, so our organization can build just the components they need, not the commodity components. It's built for things like multi-cloud, multi-compute, whatever it might be. It's also made for non-data centers because more often than not, it will be able to handle things like irregular, unreliable networks or first-class understanding of regulation systems. And if our developer wants to go on vacation, she can do that because it's maintainable. Uh, now you can pull people from the community, you can have consultants, you can have all sorts of people begin to plug in. So good, both our developer and our data scientists are now happy, we're in a better state than we were before. Uh, and instead of you having this, you, where you're uh, uh, going and processing all this stuff and having to ingest 4.4 petabits a day, you instead, you remove these individuals from the loop, you put machines that understand how to do processing, where the data is being generated out there on the edge, and then only move smaller subsets of information back, now that it has been filtered, downsampled, whatever it might be. So, that's great, that is open source, that's where things like Bacalhau have begun to step in and begin to process. But we're not here just to talk about open source platforms, we're here to talk about truly decentralized compute. So instead, let's take our solution to the next level. Let's talk about not just decentralization, but decentralized protocols. Where instead of thinking about just the platform you're running, think about protocols and systems that understand how to orchestrate and describe these problems that real users are having in a much more granular way. Our developer now says, instead of using a decentralized, or excuse me, an open source compute over data platform, let's use a decentralized protocol. So we're gonna go swap out most of this stuff ideally with very little changes to the data scientist's experience. Now we're using a decentralized OSS compute over data protocol, and instead of using any of those major uh, data centers as the only place we can deploy it, we now unlock the entire universe of compute. Think of how many millions of different devices are out there that can run these things. On Filecoin alone, you have hundreds of thousands of opportunities to execute compute right next to your data. And you have an entire universe of compute. Each one of those things is gonna have a different data set on there. Um, and so those data sets might be, are represented here by different shapes. And our data scientist now says, oh, you know what, I'd like to run an analysis on whatever, triangle data set, what do I do? Now the network can respond. The network says, hey, I have that hosted here. I can run that in the most efficient way necessary. Each one of those things is able to say, select itself and publish to that protocol, hey, here I am, come run on me. But then she says, oh, you know what? I have an additional requirement. I wanna run on only HIPAA compliant hardware. What would that look like? Well, the ones that are HIPAA compliant say I'm HIPAA compliant, and the ones that aren't say, oh, you know what, I'm not. I'm not even gonna respond to that. And so now they're able to downsample again. And then she says, oh, you know what, I'd like to do that, but now I'd like to run it at the cheapest rate. What's available to me now? And each one of those devices is now also able to respond with its own pricing, with its own structure, whatever it might be, because each one is aware of its understanding and there is no centralized ordering, orchestration, and other systems. And that is very much what you see here. That is what the Protocol Labs network, that's what things like Project Lilypad are working to unlock right now and, and where we very much want to hear from everyone in the community all the opportunities to build this out. Decentralization is ultimately about maximizing choices. And I like to come back to this very often, we call it Juan's Triangle, where you're gonna have many decentralized networks, where things plug in based on the individual user requirements, whether or not it's verifiability or privacy or performance, it's up to you to pick the things that you need to optimize. And individual providers, the in, inside of each one of these squares, you're gonna have many providers who fill in these gaps and help make this real. Right now, we do have a compute over data working group that, that uh, is publishing these things. We highly recommend 
Uh, everything you see here is available today, and you're more than welcome to come and join us. Um, they, they interact in, uh, with Filecoin, Protocol Labs, in a first-class way. Uh, so you're able to do this not just against raw compute, which is, candidly, you know, pretty available today, right? You can go ahead and get a Lambda or, you know, a, a Fly.io or anything like that. Compute's easy. Storage is hard. And that's really what we're trying to lean into here. Uh, moving that storage and scheduling using data as the first class orchestration system, uh, first class orchestration construct, excuse me, is incredibly important. And with that, that's the summary of my talk. Uh, we think that decentralized compute against storage will be a truly novel process, and we're very excited to work with everyone. Okay, round of applause for Dave. Thank you so much. And we do have time for about two questions okay. if we want to go ahead and field those from the audience. Any questions? Answered everything, did I? OK. What are some of the priorities? I'm actually curious. Like, so yeah, yeah, of course. What would you say are some of the priorities of the, of the working group slide that you just showed? And what are, what are some of the things you're tackling? Absolutely. So I would say the number one priority for the working group is um, setting the, the standards for interoperability. As you saw on this slide, you're going to have these various high-level interface constructs, verifiability or performance, um, as particularly represented in hardware, hardware types, things like that, privacy, do you support things like security, do you think support things like uh, trust execution environments, so on and so forth. Uh, for us, we want each network to say, okay, these are the things I'm hearing from my consumers or the, uh, that, that I want to plug in. This is the interface that we're all going to use as a quote unquote standard, lowercase s standard, this isn't like a standards body, that says, hey, if you want to describe what verification means to your network, use this definition language, and then you're able to publish it. And then you get job portability. Because a job that ran over here that says, I'm verifiable according to x, I can move over there and say I'm now verifiable according to y. Same with performance, same with privacy, and so on. We got one other question over here. I'll yeah. go ahead. Let me uh, hand you the mic. Hi. Um, I thought this was really amazing. I think you like really clearly articulated like why there should be demand for local um, compute that's proximal to storage. But on the supply, I guess on the supply side, I would, I would ask the other question of like, can you know independent storage providers that are not scaled entities in the Filecoin network offer compute more efficiently from a resource perspective than like? a scale provider that has the majority of their geolocated compute in Europe and the US? I, I mean, so the, I, think the, the, I think the question, if I can restate it, is, you know, oh, hyperscalers already exist. Why are you working on this? Yeah, is that like, yeah, the high level question is like, you've articulated like why there should be demand for proximal compute to storage. Yeah, yeah. But like, are there operating advantages for the compute providers that are unique to them being in this distributed network versus yeah, being yeah, a yeah. hyperscaler. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're a compute provider, you're able to bring online spare compute that is simply not available today. So if I, for example, I'm a compute provider and I have 100 GPUs in my system, like, and they're idle, I don't know, 40% of the time, they're just idle. They're not earning me any money, they're not doing anything. It is strongly incented to me to make that useful. On top of that, um, the way file coins and retrievals and other things like that work today, you're just eating the cost of ingress egress, for example, right? And that's eating up your pipe. If I can say, hey, you know what, I'm going to go out, I'm going to select great data sets, I'm going to host them, and make that compute available, now you become a differentiated advantage for people to go and execute against it. But candidly speaking, I mean, hyperscalers, and I can say this as someone who worked at all of them, have great margins here and margins that arguably are too large. Like, compute providers can take their existing hardware infrastructure, play very strongly into that market, and provide real utility to end users in a way that I think hyperscalers will always struggle, because for better or worse, remember, the data, 57% of data, is not being created in central systems, right? It's always being migrated in from my edge, from my cross zone, cross region, on-prem, things like that. If I can run that next to where my data is already being stored, then I'm at a huge advantage, and I'm saving them money, and I'm making money along the way. Well, one one follow-up question. Um, like with hyperscaler, are you, are you not like also paying for redundancy? So like you occasionally pay for compute. You know, in this alternative environment, you can like 
run compute more um, close to storage, but like if there's a spike and like the compute requirements override that single compute provider that you're demanding it from, yeah. is it like complicated for you guys to like create like a distributed mesh to then like have the pour over job to another machine? Like how do you no, deal with that spike above Absolutely, that, that's exactly what you see here. So, you know, I, when I, uh, I, I debated having a slide on here, it was already getting kind of long in the talk, but you oftentimes, as you do today, right? We have in Filecoin, we have proof of replication. Data sets are re replicated across the network very intentionally because that gives you redundancy in, in much higher level than even at a hyperscale cloud. And so if you can now do that same thing but against compute, that's great. Now, what that means will ultimately be up to the job. Does that mean executing the same job on multiple nodes? Or does it mean executing the same shard on multiple nodes? Or does it mean like creating checkpoints? There's lots of like opportunities to come up there. Um, but that is very much built into the Protocol Labs network, or excuse me, the Filecoin network, Protocol Labs, and the work that we're doing around Lilypad. And again, I, I want to stress, you know, the computer for data platforms are all thinking about this as well. Yeah.